How does a water trough lead a Mormon to Christ? Next on the Ex-Mormon Files. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Pearl, and I appreciate you joining us. We're still in Idaho, and I'm really thrilled to, to let you meet Samantha Hill. Thanks, Samantha, for coming and sharing your story. Thanks for and, having me. And you also had to drive over here from a bit. So yes. appreciate you coming and spending your time and got a cute little family. Thank you. That's neat. Uh, two, two children. Mm -hmm. huh? Yeah. So as we usually do, we kind of learn about your history. Where were you born? So I was born in Idaho Falls, Idaho. Okay. Um, grew up mostly in Shelley, which is a small town south of Idaho Falls. By okay. about 10 miles. Is it? Okay. Um, went to school there. And went everything. to school there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, were your folks members of the church? And were you yes, there? I was born in the covenant. Oh, um, well, B-I-C, as we say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. My parents were married in the Idaho Falls Temple. Oh, okay. Um, That's a beautiful temple, though, really, isn't it? It's it a, is. And the water feature and all that stuff, mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful country. And so they were active and you were just... Yeah, they were always active. We always went to church. Yeah, primary um, and Sunday primary, school. Primary, Sunday school, young women's. Yeah. All of, just, all of that. Just the normal stuff. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I have two younger sisters and then a baby brother. Oh, so you're the oldest. I'm the oldest, yes. The responsible one. <laughs> yes. I, I was the oldest too. I know how that works. <laughs> So, uh, did you take seminary? I did take seminary all four years, graduated from seminary. Oh my um, was your typical Mormon teenager. Yeah. Did you ever go on the young women camps? And that oh yeah, I went to girls camp a couple years. I went with my ward and my aunt's ward. So did you? two different sets of girls camps. Did they bear their testimonies in those uh, young women programs like the, the boys do? Yeah. You know, I never went to, well, I guess I did go to the young women's because I was bishop for a while. And, <laughs> and so I met uh, or had them. Yeah, we sat around the campfire. And yep. Did you ever bear your testimony? Oh, you have to. You're <laughs> <laughs> kind of put on the spot. You're not, on, huh? <laughs> you're not one of the girls if you don't bear your testimony. Yeah. Did you ever do it in sacrament meeting, a fast and testimony meeting? And a few times. Did you? Yeah. So just never any question that the church wasn't the only true church? No. Um, I had, I didn't always feel that it was the most important thing in my life. The church, really? Um, I remember in Young Women's coming home from church, and I know a lot of families did this. We get home from church. What did you learn in church today as we're sitting around right. the dinner table? Right. And I said, oh, in Young Women's, we talked about deciding now that you're going to get married in the temple. Sure. And my mom and dad, of course, were like, well, you've decided that, right? And I was like, well, I guess. I just don't see the big deal. And of course well, it was- Well, they tried to explain it to you, I guess. Yes, they tried yeah. to explain it to me, and then they were very concerned, obviously, that I didn't see the importance of this, and how could I not- Yeah. How could I not want this for myself? And I would never make the celestial kingdom if I wasn't married sure. in the temple. And right. I kind of agree. You know, when you're a teenager and you realize you've lost the battle. And so <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, I see. Yep, you're right. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but I never, there were always things that I thought were more important than hmm. being 100% committed to the church. Did you sense any guilt over that, those feelings or? A lot. Oh, you did? Um, I yeah. actually went to a trusted friend of ours who had been a bishop and mm. um, asked him once if there was anywhere that he knew of that there was a good guy clause in the Bible. And he asked me what I meant by that. No. And <laughs> I told him, there's got to be something somewhere that says that people who have done good in their lives but aren't Mormon can still go to heaven. Because I knew so many good people who weren't active or weren't members of the church, yeah. and I could not believe that they would not go to be with God just because they hadn't gone to the temple. 
And did he provide an answer for you? you talk, no. Talk about the millennium or anything that we were going to get yeah, things worked out. Yeah, basically that. We basically, he told gospel. me that they would be taught the gospel right. while they were in. But they did have heaven, to become. Mormon. But they would have to accept it there. Right. And become just, a Mormon. <laughs> yeah, it just never sat right with me that yeah, there was no other way. Yeah. To go about it. Oh, well, that's fascinating. You kind of had a little. Uh, not rebellion, I guess, but just uh, an interesting perspective on things. Yeah. But you ended up taking Institute, right? Yeah. So I went to Idaho State for two years. Okay. Which is very predominantly Mormon. Mormon. Sure. And so I took Institute because that's what you do. And right. I was in the Relief Society. Um, I was in charge of visiting teaching. I was the visiting teaching coordinator. Yeah. Um, had a lot of involvement in the singles branch and you did compassionate service I did or something I did compassionate service later yeah. Um, but yeah I was very very involved in church activities and was there anything ever doctrinal or that ever came up that kind of bothered you anything that you learned either um, in institute or anything a lot of things bothered me with polygamy and just the view of women in the church. Yeah. That knowing that I could not get to heaven without a husband to take me there was really upsetting. And it was also really upsetting. My grandmother believes that she may not get to heaven because my grandpa didn't keep his covenants. And knowing that something that had nothing to do with her was completely would out of her affect her control would affect her like that yeah always really bothered me well if you can think back uh, i know you haven't been out that long but what did you think of jesus as a mormon that he he was our savior if we were good enough that he was there. I saw him as the ultimate judge. Oh. He was there to decide if we were good enough for his grace or not. And from the time that I was about 17, um, I was certain that I was not good enough for his grace. I tried really hard um, several times. There were a couple times well, through college that I became inactive and then went back to the church. Yeah. And every time thinking, I've got to find, got to find that key to, to make myself good enough <laughs> for his grace because he's never going to, accept, to me. accept me. Yeah. Just always climbing the ladder was the way we talked about it in the, with our last guest. It just, you're never doing enough. You're just always climbing the ladder. Yeah. And Jesus kind of makes up the difference at the end, I guess. And, yeah. So what happens uh, after this, after school? So I um, decided I wanted to get my master's degree, mm. and I moved to Grand Forks, North Dakota oh. to do that. And Grand Forks is definitely Bible Belt. Oh. There are a lot of churches in Grand Forks. <laughs> One LDS chapel really? that serves a 50-mile radius. Mm. So I went from having always lived where everyone is LDS <laughs> to living where no one was LDS. And I got really strange questions um, when I started my master's program. Um, I'm an occupational therapist. Okay. And so one of the things that we do is treat people in groups a lot. So we had classes where we would kind of learn how you run a therapeutic group. Mm. And so we'd get to ask each other questions and I got asked if my mom was the first or second wife. <laughs> okay. I got asked if I was breaking the rules by wearing pants. Thought you had to wear dresses. Thought I something. had to wear dresses all the time. Um, I remember one day in group, we were going around telling our favorite um, holiday. And I said, I love Pioneer Day. Oh. And everyone stared at me. <laughs> I had no idea that that was an LDS holiday. Oh, you didn't? 
So everyone's staring at me. I'm like, you know, when we celebrate the pioneers. <laughs> you thought everybody celebrated the 24th of July. Huh? Yeah, I thought that was something that <laughs> national holiday. Everyone did, and I just got you know stared at, and then that's funny. I of course explained like the pioneers and explained that I had pioneer heritage and mm. <laughs> and it, yeah, people just really didn't understand yeah. what Mormons were. And I had a roommate who um, was very critical of my religious views so in a very were, nice way. So you were keeping the commandments according to Mormonism. According to Mormonism. Yeah. And she would question that a lot. She would say, well, so if you have to do this, but the Bible says this, <laughs> that doesn't make sense. And I was completely clueless. Yeah. It's like, where are you finding this in the Bible? <laughs> like, because I didn't know the Bible. Right. I didn't. I read the Book of Mormon several times in high school and, and I never, never made it never, all the way through the Bible. Never read the Bible. Yeah. And so, and she wasn't, um, she wasn't a Christian, but she had grown up knowing the Bible. And so she posed a lot of questions that really got me thinking. Wow. And while I was in North Dakota, it basically became inactive. Um, didn't really. Did you ever go to church with her or anyone else? No. Um, I went to church a couple times with a friend of mine to a Catholic church. Yeah. And I was really turned off by it. <laughs> um, the priest there found out that I was LDS. Oh. And the second time I went, his sermon was about how terrible the LDS people are. <laughs> And so I was just really yeah, laid in wait for you. Really yeah. turned off by that. Like, yeah. why would I want to be involved in any church if they're all just going to bash each other? Right. And so I really didn't. Okay. Didn't go to church at that time. So what happens after that? Then did you stay in Grand Forks? No. So I got my degree and I took a job in Evanston, Wyoming. Okay. So I was back where there were quite a few LDS people. Right. Yeah. And I didn't know anyone in Evanston, <laughs> but I knew how to make friends. And that was to go to church because your ward has to like you. <laughs> and, and that was, take you in, yeah. that was how I looked at it. You know, yeah. it's your ward family. They have to take you in. I'll make yeah. friends there. Well, and it's all you really knew. I mean, you'd gone to another church, but you, that was your culture and everything. Yeah, but, it was yeah. my culture. It was what I knew. Yeah. And so um, I, I started going to church again. And one of my coworkers was LDS as well. And so she was really supporting me and getting back to church. And yeah. um, did that make you feel good? Um, I mean, you feel like you were not doing really, the right thing or something? Not really. Um, mm -hmm. It made me feel like I had a place. It made me feel like I belonged. Yeah, had a place too. But after questioning things through college, yeah. It just never felt right. I can't say it felt wrong. Yeah. But it just didn't feel quite right. Okay. So you eventually meet a young man? I do. Is so that soon after this? Or was this in is, Evanston? Yes, this was in Evanston. It was actually soon after. I moved to Evanston in June. And in October, I started working with my bishop through some repentance process so that I could get a temple recommend. Oh, okay. Um, well, this is an interesting story. <laughs> yes. Also in October, I met someone at work. Um, he was a security, I worked at a state hospital and he was a security guard there. Yeah. And he and I just kind of became friends. In December, we started dating. And he's? And he is not, not a member of the church. Okay, not a Mormon, okay. Not a Mormon. Um, my bishop had said that by the new year, I should be able to have worked through the repentance process and have my temple recommend. About two weeks after I started dating um, this guy, and I told my bishop, I was seeing my bishop once a week for interviews, and so I had told him, yeah, I'm seeing this new guy. He's really great. He's really nice to me. He's not a member. Um, about two weeks after that, my bishop sat me down in our interview and said, you know, I just feel very strongly that I've received this, this from the Lord that 
you're not ready for a full temple recommend. So we're just going to give you a recommend to do baptisms for the dead. And I was devastated. Yeah. I had thought that I was doing what the church wanted me to do. I was sure. working so hard. And I could see that this had everything to do with my dating a non-member. Yeah. And in my mind, there was no question that it wasn't revelation no, from nothing God. Nothing to do with you or your worthiness or anything. Just probably he just received inspiration that uh, yeah. that you weren't worthy or couldn't, couldn't issue that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you didn't feel too good about that, I, I guess. I didn't. Yeah. But I continued to go to church. Um, so that was in December. In February, I got engaged. Okay. To this young man. To this young man. Okay. Um, I was taking him to church with me when he could. He worked shift work, and so he couldn't always go. But I was taking him to church with me, and I started to see the way they were treating him at church. Was he taking the lessons or anything? Or Not at you, that time. Did you hope he was going to become a Mormon? Yes. At yeah. that time, I, I had, yeah, yeah. had hoped that he would become a Mormon. And actually, when he called my dad to ask if he could Maybe. propose to me, um, my dad asked him to take the, the lessons from the missionaries. Oh, okay. And so he did end up doing that um, later that summer. But just seeing the way that, you know, people would come up to him and introduce themselves and, oh, I see that you're here with Samantha. What ward are you from? <laughs> and he'd say, oh, I'm not from a ward. Uh, oh, okay. And they would just walk away. They would just become completely gosh. uninterested. Yeah. Um, so then the same bishop that was inspired that I wasn't ready for a recommend, um, we asked him to marry us. And he said that the only way he would is if Jeremy was baptized before the wedding. Really? So Jeremy's stepdad is a Methodist minister. And so he was the one that married us. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. The bishop would take that kind of a stand. And it was, it yeah, was very... Slap in the face. Very kind. hard. Yeah. Especially when that's your life. I mean, your, your culture, your everything. Yeah. I mean, you'd worked hard. And... So... Uh, what happens after you get married? Then? So we get married, and yeah. now I'm in a new ward. Yeah. Um, we, we moved in. Jeremy had a house, and so we moved into his house. And I'm in a new ward, and um, I got called to primary. Okay. So I was teaching the little ones, which I loved. Um, struggled. Again, seeing the way that people treated me now that I was married to a non-member. Yeah. It, it was very, very Sweet. interesting. I am six foot tall. Yeah. I was training a service dog at the time. So I was bringing a dog to church every Sunday. That doesn't go over too well then. <laughs> Actually, people didn't mind. Oh. But these are all things, if you didn't know my name, the really tall sister. Oh. The sister that brings the dog to church. <laughs> But I would hear people describe me as the sister that's married to the non-member. Yeah. And very judgmental. Very judgmental, and that's not how I identify yeah, myself. I, I just, I, I just relate to that so well, so much. Darn it. And so that just, that really, <laughs> that really was probably the first thing that started. I quit coming to sacrament meeting a lot. Did you? I didn't want to let my primary kids down. So you kept teaching. So I primary. kept teaching primary, but I was skipping yeah. a lot of sacrament meeting. Now you, at some point you have tried to get pregnant mm -hmm. and tell us that story. So we were trying to start a family. Um, we were not successful for, it had been about a year that we had been struggling and not being able to be successful. And I was really, struggling with my faith at the time. And I called my dad and I said, dad, I'm just really struggling. I don't feel, I don't understand why this would happen to us. We're good people. We would be wonderful parents. And I, I shared some other things that I was struggling with my, with my dad. And he said, well, why don't you talk to your bishop? Maybe he can give you a blessing because my parents are in Idaho and I'm in Wyoming oh, okay. where they really can't right. come to help me. 
So I made an interview with the bishop, went in and started to talk to him about the things that were bothering me. And he asked me if I had ever considered that I may not be having children because I had chosen to marry a non-member. <laughs> I have not gone into an LDS building except for family, baptisms, farewells since that time. That, that, that was, broke the camel That back. was the end. So it wasn't really over doctrine or anything that you, you just had this... I just had this burning feeling that someone who would be so insensitive judgmental. and judgmental could not be led by God. And, and to claim inspiration, I think. Yeah. That's, yeah. I just, I didn't know Jesus and I didn't understand him, but I was certain in my heart that this wasn't of him. Yeah, this doesn't sound very godlike. Yeah. Well, tell us how 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 the how Christianity starts entering into your life. So, like I said, my husband's um, parents both actually are Methodist ministers. Oh, so he's he's active then, or had he been active in? No. So church? his mom married his stepdad when he was a teenager. Okay. So he went from never going to church <laughs> to living in a parsonage and being at church all the time all the as a 16-year-old boy. Okay. So he had kind of come and gone from church, but he had never really... He was a believer, but he had never really accepted Christ fully. Okay. Um, but when I came home and said, I'm never going back to church, I can't do it, this is what... I actually didn't tell him what happened. I just said I had a bad experience, and I can't go back. And he's, he was okay with that, And course. he was perfectly yeah. fine with that. Um, so he encouraged me to try other churches in our town in Wyoming, and I, I tried a few. There were some nice messages, but never really anything that really hit you. For, that really hit me. Yeah. And I don't know at the time if I was really open to that either. I was yeah. still pretty hurt and pretty upset. Um, I ended up taking a job that had me out of town a lot. So I wasn't really going to church a lot because I was traveling all the time. Mm. Um, after a year of my husband living in our home and me being on the road all the time, I actually was offered a job in Blackfoot, Idaho. And so we sold our house and moved to Blackfoot. And moved to Blackfoot. Okay. Is this where the trough story happens? Yes. Okay, so tell us about that. So um, we had been in Blackfoot about four months, my husband was working at uh, Cal Ranch stores, and he calls me on his lunch break one day, on a Saturday, and said, you have to go to church tonight. <laughs> I said, okay, it's Saturday. <laughs> like, I was just really confused, and he says, so I was helping this gentleman with a water trough, and he told me that he had melted a hole in the bottom of his. So, of course, my husband asked, well, how did that happen? And he says, well, I'm not from here. I'm from South Carolina, and I didn't know that you needed to put a protective cage on your trough heater <laughs> or it would melt a plastic water trough. Oh, my goodness. So he had melted the bottom out of his water trough. Wasn't holding water. Wasn't holding water. And so my husband's helping him find a new tank heater because, of course, that ruined the tank heater and helping him find oh, a new gosh. water trough. Yeah. And he just asked, well, what brought you here from South Carolina? And he says, well, I'm the pastor at the cowboy church here in town. And my husband and I are both from that Western culture. Yeah. And so that piqued his interest. Wow. And he found out that they meet on Saturday nights at 7. Yeah. That's our, our, ours in Roy, Utah uh, also uh, meets on Saturday night. Yeah. Yeah. So he says, you know, this is, this is the directions to it. And it turned out that they actually met um, in an indoor arena owned by some friends of my family. So I knew where, when he said, well, they're out at the mill iron, I said, oh, I know where that, that is. is. Okay. And so I went that night and he said, be sure to introduce yourself to the pastor, which wasn't something I was very comfortable with, but I waited till the end of the service and it was, I don't even remember what the message was about, but it was very nice. Mm -hmm. um, it felt comfortable. Yeah. And I went up afterwards and introduced myself and 
pastor was very nice and, you know, it invited me to bring my husband back when he wasn't working. And <laughs> so we started going to the cowboy church. Um, and about six months later, I'd been telling my husband for a couple weeks, you know, I think the next time that the pastor, you know, the next time that we go to church at the end where he invites a, you, if you haven't accepted Jesus to come up and pray with him, I think I'm going to go pray with him and accept Jesus. And my husband said, oh, okay, that's, that's great. Um, so. Now, now, did this cause some stirring in your heart for from Mormonism? I mean, this is totally a, yeah. a different a departure. It, it was, it was, was it very different. For you? At times it was traumatic. But the, the biggest thing that I can say is I never felt sitting in a Mormon church, I never felt that burning of the spirit that people yeah. talk about, yeah. which I just chalked up to. I'm not good enough I'm not worthy. To, to feel that the, the yeah. spirit won't be with me because I'm not worthy of that. But I felt that to go down in front at the, at the cowboy Jesus. church multiple times during during the message, there would be things that would just really hit hit my heart, and I'd really just get that feeling that this is right. This is this is Jesus. Did you understand at that point uh, grace and what Jesus had done? Had that message been being shared with you at that? Yeah, that message was was being shared with me, and I think the longer I've been a Christian, the more that well, you understand that I that. understand it. Yeah, but but I had a. A decent idea of of grace and what that really meant in a biblical sense. Yeah, what Jesus really did yeah. did for us that uh, we couldn't do for ourselves, and yeah. that's so different than Mormonism, isn't it? Where you just so different. Where you feel like you've always got to be doing and doing and yeah, and it was it was hard for me and to guilty accept when it you're first. not. Oh, it was. It, it was hard for me to believe to that. believe that there didn't have to be. <laughs> works on my part yeah. because that's what I had been taught my whole life. Yeah. But, um, but that night we went to church and, and the pastor ended, ended the message with the invitation to accept Jesus. Um, I stood up to walk to the front and my husband, who I did not know was planning to accept Jesus that night, stood up and walked to the front with me. Oh, is that? That's awesome. Isn't yeah. It? <laughs> Yeah, so about six months later, we were actually able to time it to when my husband's parents had come for a visit. We were able to get baptized, and we were actually baptized in a water trough. <laughs> By that pastor. By that pastor. <laughs> what a great story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you sharing this, and uh, uh, Anything you want to say to the to your family or friends? I know they must. There must have been a lot of maybe some turmoil there with family. There, and... there has been turmoil. Um, a lot of a lot of just denial. Them not not wanting to talk about it. Yeah. Um, they don't know very much, but they don't want to talk about much either. Yeah, they don't. Yeah. They don't want to know. I know. Um, but I think just to, to anybody who's who's questioning or who's not quite sure Jesus is the answer. Okay. And I remember when I was really active in institute and seminary reading John 3:16 and thinking those poor misguided Christians who poor think God all they have so to do is accept Jesus. And now <laughs> I know that John 3:16 uh -huh. is the key to it all. It's beautiful. It, it is my favorite scripture. Yeah. Yeah, what a great... And, and don't you feel a freedom and a confidence and a, a love for God and Jesus that you just never... that we just don't have as Mormons? I mean, yeah. they claim they're Christian, but they, they're missing... But I, I had no idea no. when I was Mormon what I was missing out on. Yeah. Oh, Samantha, well, I appreciate any, again, any last minute to family or friends and look at them in the um, camera here. And <laughs> I think even though it's hard, 
And even though for, for a lot of us, it's what we've known our whole lives, the relationship that I have with Jesus is worth all of the heartache and the fear and the guilt that I had when I started to look outside the church. And all of, all of that fear and guilt and heartache is taken up by him and his grace. Ah, beautiful. And it's so different. It's so freeing. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Samantha, for coming. And we'll see you next time here on the Ex-Mormon Files.